So good evening and welcome to our Historical Society program. Uh, I'm Kathy Cavallari. I'm the president of the Westboro Historical Society. I'm delighted you've joined us this evening. Uh, the Westboro Historical Society was founded in 1889 to preserve and celebrate his local history through research programs and the preservation of artifacts. Um, our headquarters is at the Sibley House, an 1844 Greek Revival home built by the slaymaker William Sibley, located at 13 Parkman Street. And in the house, we do have um, three centuries of artifacts dating back to the founding of the town and the Revolutionary War. Um, for more than a century, the society's mission has been to celebrate local history and bring that history to life through our monthly presentations, Sibley House tours, which we hope to resume in the spring, and special events. Um, so if you enjoy tonight's program, we encourage you to like our Facebook page, which is Westboro Historical Society, um, and check out our website, www.westborohistory.org and consider becoming a member through our website. Um, our presenter tonight is Tom Morgan. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Tom tells me that he is actually a newbie to Westboro, having only lived here for 44 years. <laughs> um, for much of that time, he says he was known in town as Donna Morgan's husband as their three children went through the Westboro schools. And I just wanna say my husband can relate to that. Uh, um, he's been a member of the Congregational Church for 42 of the 44 years uh, and is currently the interim church historian. Uh, his interest in the religions in, in, in Westboro began when he found out that the First Baptist Church in our town ended up in Woodville, which is the northern part of Hopkinton. Uh, Tom has been involved with Westboro Public Access Television, the Westboro TV that's recording us tonight, since 1994 um, as a producer and later on the board of directors. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, since he's a bit of a computer guru, he uh, developed the Congregational Church's Multi-Computer Video Center uh, to support live streaming for hybrid worship services and church committee meetings. Uh, Tom has a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from Yale and an MBA from Babson. Uh, he retired in 2013 after nearly 40 years as uh, at both Data General and then EMC as a manager in the integration of computers and storage to create backup products for open systems and mainframes. Uh, but lucky for us, he enjoys researching religious history as a hobby, so we're going to benefit from that. Um, and just a reminder, any questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat, and I will relate them to Tom at the end of the presentation. So now I turn it over to Tom Morgan. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks very much. Let me uh, begin our screen sharing here. So um, keeping in the Puritan tradition, these are very plain slides, <laughs> but um, the uh, good Recording evening. Recording in progress. Good, good evening to everyone and uh, very pleased that uh, you, you've all chosen to spend some time uh, kind of walking through uh, roughly 300 years of Westboro history in 34 slides. Um, the, uh, I think most of you are aware that um, the town began with uh, a single Puritan church in colonial times. And that today, uh, I think we're still, at, we're now at 13 active houses of worship. And hence the, the byline, the tagline here, first one, now many. Um, I began putting these talks together along this topic for the confirmands at the Congregational Church, the youth who were considering joining the church. And so we were kind of giving them a, um, you know, a whole series of, of lessons, introductions, whatever, to uh, not only the church theology, but also the history of the church. Um, and I thought that um, many of them, given that they had an attachment to our church, might in fact uh, kind of have associates on their own who might have similar interests, although not necessarily with our church, but with some 
other of the houses of worship in town. Um, and it could well be the same for many of you uh, who are either interested or perhaps deeply involved in one of the congregations in town or another. Um, to that end, the, the earlier versions of this talk that I had, the byline was, we pass by our history every day because it struck me all the places in town that we sort of zoom by on the way through the Rotary and others that in fact have uh, historical, historical significance um, for faith communities. And so that's the, that's the, the, uh, the goal here is to kind of impart some of the things that, that I've come across and learned uh, that connect uh, the faith communities in Westboro first from the, the first single town church now to the uh, over uh, about 13 uh, houses of worship in town. So I want to first um, just briefly acknowledge that uh, I didn't do all this myself. Uh, there are some real historians who are on this uh, acknowledgments list. And, uh, and I am grateful for um, uh, many of the resources which are now online, made the, made the research infinitely easier. And I do want to acknowledge the Westboro Historical Society for, for sponsoring this presentation. So let's talk about the Puritans. Uh, we have to because that's kind of where the town began out of that tradition. But I think it's also important to, to, with the, the, to put the Puritans in their own context and time. Now, yeah, we know that the Puritans were Protestants. Uh, their movement arose in the late 16th century within the Church of England. But just to recap, um, the, the Church of England was started by Henry VIII as a, as a way of breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church at the time. Um, and it uh, over time, it, it sort of swung either toward Catholicism or Protestantism, uh, sort of depending on who was on the throne of England at the time. Uh, Elizabeth I uh, was uh, raised a Catholic. She had actually quite a bit of an of impact on the, the eventual shape and, and traditions that uh, were in the, uh, the Church of England. Um, for example, uh, the choice for, uh, uh, that, that the Puritans took. Now the Puritans basically, uh, as it indicates here, wanted to simplify even that uh, aspect of the Church of England, the doctrine and, and the worship practices. Um, and for example, they um, uh, chose to have their clergy wear black rather than the white vestments that were traditional in the Catholic Church. And that's carried forward in many congregations today. Um, they, uh, the, the civil governance was dictated by the clergy based on Puritan principles. So basically, the Puritans established a church state based around the Puritan principles. Uh, church governance was interestingly decided by local congregations and not necessarily by uh, an ecclesiastical hierarchy um, like bishops and archbishops. But uh, they did insist on uh, strictness in religious discipline and, uh, and home life as well. One of the characteristics of their outlook was that every public danger and every, everything that bad happened came because God was unhappy with what people were doing, the people were doing. And as a result, there were often uh, fasts and other signs of penance that were declared by the clergy as a way to show uh, God that people understood he was not happy or she was not happy with he at the time, um, with um, what the people were doing and that they, they, they repented. But there were trials, uh, even death for nonconformists because the Puritans, while they wanted religious freedom, and that's the reason why they, they came to the, the Salem and eventually Boston uh, areas, they were not interested in religious freedom for anybody else. So they had the uh, habit of uh, really persecuting uh, Anglicans, uh, Baptists, um, Quakers, um, and eventually what happened was that the, uh, uh, the crown in England became so unhappy with the persecution that the Puritans were doing of these other religions uh, 
that um, they re revoked the charter for Massachusetts Bay Colony in the late 1600s. Um, so, so it was uh, very interesting. And I also kind of find it interesting to, you know, there, they, some people say that history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So if we think about some of the most current events that are happening in other parts of the globe, kind of look down the list here of the characteristics of the Puritan uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony, I think we see some things that rhyme and kind of make you wonder. But the result, as I say, was the town supported ministries and church, ministers and churches, town supported, tax supported for nearly 200 years as a result of this Puritan beginning. Now, we have to also talk about uh, how Westboro aro itself arose. Um, Marlboro uh, was uh, an area in central Massachusetts that was uh, settled in 1657. It was resettled multiple times because it frequently is being burned down by unhappy uh, uh, Indians. Um, next to Marlboro was this area called Chauncey, and that was given by the colony to Charles Chauncey in 1659. Charles Chauncey was an educator, a clergyman, and secondarily a physician. He was the second president of Harvard College. Harvard had been established in 1636 to educate Puritan clergymen. That was the, that was the role that, uh, of Harvard. Um, and Chauncey was the president until his death in 1672. Um, but the colony owed him some money uh, because he really didn't get paid very much for being the president of Harvard. So they granted him this area uh, around what we now call Lake Chauncey, named Chauncey, um, and uh, as a way of settling that debt. Eventually, the town of Marlboro said, oh, you know, we'd really like to annex the Chauncey area and have it added. And that was, that was approved by the, uh, uh, by the council. So one might say, all right, well, that's cool, but why did people settle in Westboro in the first place? What, what is it that attracted them? And this map uh, kind of shows a couple of the key reasons. Um, now, there were no permanent Indian settlements in, uh, in this area. Uh, there was seasonal hunting and seasonal camps and things like that, but it wasn't that there were any permanent villages here. However, in this area, there were a couple of major trails that, had, that were ancient uh, that intersected right near where we are. One of these was the, the old Connecticut path, which led down toward Hartford from the, the Bay Area. And the other was the Narragansett path, uh, Narragansett Trail, which went north and south up into Canada. So these became uh, easy trade routes and transportation routes for the European settlers as they moved into this area. Um, and note that this Narragansett Trail uh, is most likely the route that was taken by the Indians who kidnapped the Rice Boys in uh, 1704. So basically, Westboro was already uh, sort of a, a central area. Um, so taking advantage of these trails, the Puritan missionaries in the late 1600s uh, began to prop, proselytize and try to propagate uh, their faith out into central Massachusetts. One of the ways in which they did that was to establish uh, about a dozen uh, settlements known as praying villages. And these were um, Indian settlements that were uh, converted to Christianity by folks like John Eliot uh, in the late 1600s. And notable among them in our area were Grafton, Natick, uh, Hopkinton, Ashland, um, and uh, among those dozen. Um, and in fact, in Grafton, there is still a, a plot which belongs to the Nipmuc nations and is maintained by them and maintained by the town to them. So there's still some evidence today. However, most of these praying villages were disbanded during King Philip's War in uh, the late 1600s, which was a bloody Indian uprising. Um, and it, it sort of <clears throat> soured the relationships uh, there, to say, to say the least. 
So timelines are interesting. And here I put together a timeline that, that depicts kind of things that happened before the charter for Westboro was actually granted in about in 1717. Um, and one of the things that was going on here is that there were wars in Europe which um, had reflections into uh, North America because the parties in Europe that were at war, England, France, Spain, uh, all had possessions in North America. And as a consequence, um, there, those conflicts, you know, sort of bled over and, and led to conflicts here in North America. What this timeline shows is a couple of things. Number one, the, the block shows the point in time following a couple of <laughs> wars where the charter was granted. It also blocks out uh, things that happened afterward because what I wanted to do is kind of say, let's put ourselves in the knowledge base, if you will, of the, of the, the, the Westboro settlers at that time. A lot of the worst of the wars seemed to be over for a while. Um, a number of the Indian uh, conflicts, like that which led to Mary Goodnell's uh, killing in uh, Marlboro, were basically abated. So it seemed like seemed like a good time to uh, to to establish a town here in Westboro. Um, so um, they really couldn't see, as you know, they're kind of blocked out here. They couldn't see what was coming. Uh, but some things that we can appreciate now, which followed, uh, and notably like the French and Indian War, and eventually the, the Revolutionary War. So there was more conflict in store for Westboro, but it was, a, it was a period of relative peace during this time and fostered good growth in this area. The original Westboro was the West Borough of Marlboro, and it was centered around Lake Chauncey. Um, the original Westboro included Northboro as well as today's Westboro. And then there were parts uh, of the surrounding areas from Shrewsbury and Sutton that were kind of added in. Um, so um, the map indicates where the, the meeting house was because in order to be a town at the time, townspeople were required to do two things. They had to build a meeting house which were both as a church and a town meeting house. And they had to hire and pay a pastor, those two requirements. So in 1717, late 1717, Westboro was granted a, a charter and incorporated, and they selected uh, an area very close to Lake Chauncey as the, uh, where they were gonna build their meeting house. Uh, this was uh, off Oak Street, today is Oak Street, in an area called Powder Hill. It's very near Spectrum House, uh, right in that area today. Um, one of the parts of their governance was that only church members could vote in town affairs. And then as a result, the town and the church records from those periods are essentially right together and, 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 and the same set of records. Now, the first meeting of the town was actually called in early 1718. And there was a gentleman named Daniel Elmer who had been apparently preaching in this area. And the town, the, the minutes from that first town meeting indicated that the, the, the members said, all right, let's, let's call this Daniel Elmer uh, to be our pastor. Let's, let's get moving here. Um, Elmer was a 1713 graduate of Yale, sometime before my time. But as I said, he'd been preaching in the town already. Um, he was given the title to the 50 acre ministerial farm, which was also part of the requirement that a, when a town wanted to form, they had to reserve a plot of land and give it uh, forever to the pastor to own. It turns out though that uh, Elmer really didn't uh, mesh well with the town or the ecclesiastical council that kind of uh, was in place to uh, approve uh, such folks to, to be permanent pastors. So he was not accepted by this council um, and as a result did not become truly the first settled pastor of the town. Um, so when that, as that happened, he said, well, later for this, he sold the 50 acre farm and moved to Springfield and then on to Connecticut. Uh, 
So for a number of years, actually, Westboro was without a pastor. Finally, in about 1724, almost six years after the town had started, had been chartered, the townspeople finally completed the first meeting house near Lake Chauncey. What's shown here from the records is a sketch of what that uh, meeting house was, uh, we expected that it looked like. About a story and a half high, uh, 40 feet long, 30 feet wide, and as I say, it was located at that time on what is today Oak Street near Speckman House. And in 1724, uh, Ebenezer Parkman apparently had been, been preaching a bit in, in this area and was known to the town. Um, Parkman was born in Boston. He came into, went into Harvard College at age 14 to become a Puritan clergyman um, and was actually uh, preached and then ordained here in October of 1724 at the tender age of 21. Uh, and he served as our town minister until he died in 1782, an extremely long stretch. Um, the, um, his, his original pulpit, which is shown in the picture here, um, is in the Parkman Chapel at the Congregational Church. And that chapel is actually sized to the dimensions of that first meeting house. So if you're familiar with it or have a chance to visit that, I'll give you some idea of what that first meeting house was, uh, was sized at, what it was like. Um, and in the view of my, that I'm on here, uh, just over my shoulder, back this way, you can see in the distance that uh, that first pulpit inside the inside the chapel. Now, interestingly enough, um, in Hopkinton, uh, in July of 1724, just prior to to Parkman being settled here in Westboro, Hopkins Hopkinton settled a pastor named Samuel Barrett. Now, Barrett apparently was a colleague and a close friend from Harvard. Of, uh, of Ebenezer Parkman. And as early as 1719, uh, uh, Barrett is mentioned in Parkman's diary. The, Parkman basically kept a diary, by the way, from the early seven, late 17 teens until his death in 1782. Um, and and Bass, Barrett is mentioned frequently there. Um, similar to Ebenezer Parkman, Barrett served there until his death, which was in 1772. And the, from a society or social perspective, the records show that both Parkman and Barrett had slaves. Parkman had one for a short time, maybe a year, but Barrett had several. Um, the congregation in the town grew and in about 24, 25 years, that first meeting house, even though it had been outfitted and, 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 and worked on, was just too small for the congregation. So they decided in 1748 that they would describe, they would construct a new or second meeting house. By that time, the commerce of town had really grown nearer to the junction of the trails that was shown in one of those earlier maps and the roads that had been developed, uh, east and west roads like the, the Boston Turnpike. And it turned out that the location that was chosen is on what is today the Westboro Rotary. Uh, <clears throat> in order to have materials to complete the building of that second meeting house, uh, they were reluctant, but they ended up, the people ended up tearing down the first meeting house so that they had building materials to complete the second meeting house. Um, now over time, the, uh, the second meeting house itself was enlarged to handle future growth, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, part of uh, his employment contract with the town was that if the town ever relocated the meeting house to another part of town, that and that was more than a mile from where his first parsonage was, which was right next to the first meeting house, the town would provide him a new second parsonage. So the, the area in the media, somewhat center of town for the second meeting house was in fact more than a mile. And so the town built him a second parsonage. The site of that was where the mobile station is on West Main Street, the original site. Uh, later that parsonage was uh, purchased, moved up the hill, still exists at the top of the hill, um, 
one of the complaints that the uh, the townspeople had about the design for the parsonage that Parkman chose was that the windows were unseemly large for a pastor to have. And I think later on, Pars uh, Parkman says, yeah, they were right. Uh, I probably shouldn't have done that, but the windows were the windows that they are. But the uh, the town, the, the parsonage still exists today. So around 7, 1776, um, given where the new meeting house was in then Westboro, the town uh, that had been relocated south, uh, the church members in the northern part of the town grew tired of the long trip to church and the town meetings. In fact, <laughs> having to go to Marlborough was one of the reasons that the Westboro settlers said, let's set our own town. That's a long way to go to Marlboro to, to, for, town, for church and meetings. So the same kind of uh, realization uh, dawned upon the, the people in, uh, in Northboro, the north part of Westboro. So they petitioned to have uh, a town of their own called, strangely enough, Northboro. That was reckoned, it recognized in 1776. This map shows where that second meeting house is with respect to the borders of Westboro, which have not changed since 1766. There were, during Parkman's pastorate, there were a number of, of uh, important events. Um, one of these was a social and, uh, if you will, a religious movement that, in retrospect, historians call the First Great Awakening, roughly in the 1730 to 1755 period is when this was uh, active. Um, and it was really a widespread uh, revitalization movement and, and uh, evangelicalism uh, that, that took hold and a pulling away from ritual and sacramentalism and church hierarchy. And it began to make Christianity uh, a much more intensely personal uh, religion for the average person. In part, this was driven by multiple diphtheria epidemics in the early 1740s and Westboro and Boston uh, suffered greatly from these epidemics. Um, now I mentioned before that calamities such as this were seen and, and termed to be uh, retribution from uh, the divine for um, things that the, the townspeople and people were, were not doing correctly. And so uh, as a result, you know, fasting and praying and so forth were the response to try to show penance. But with this diphtheria epidemic, uh, fasting and praying uh, had precious little effect. And in fact, it was uh, once the sources of diphtheria were, were identified, it was determined that the practices for dealing with diphtheria patients, like having them all get in the same room with the children, uh, were contributing to the to the uh, intensity of the epidemic. Uh, interestingly enough, once the sources were eventually found, there were a whole series of changes in both public health and personal practices, which we take for granted today, like sewers, like town water systems, like using bed sheets. So um, there there were some. Uh, if you will, positive effects that, that came out of that. One of the effects, though, was that it began to shake the faith, if you will, that um, the townspeople in, in the congregations had in the leadership of these local ministers like Parkman. And Parkman notes in his diary that around this period of time, some of the leading parishioners came to him and said, you know, um, the people are not happy with kind of the direction you're you're taking them in and, and counseling them to take. And some of these preachers like George Whitefield, Jonathan Edwards, and, and others who were, you know, gave eventually rise to the Baptist and Methodist movements, uh, they were they kind of so discontent, if you will, at least alternate views of relationship to the divine and the clergy uh, than what the Puritans had advocated. Um, so Parkman listened, thought about it, but basically, as far as we know, really didn't uh, substantially change his Puritan uh, outlook. 
for the rest of his um, his pastorate here. However, in the south, uh, mainly in the south of the or the colonies, uh, this strengthened Baptists and Methodists, which in fact did eventually have an impact on uh, on Westboro. Parkman died, as I mentioned, in I think 1782. Shortly after that, um, there was a movement known as the Second Great Awakening, which was longer. It went from the late 1790s, 1700s into the middle of the uh, 1800s. And these were really led by these Baptist and Methodist uh, preachers. Um, and there was a result, there was rapidly rising membership in those kinds of congregations. There were also social changes that arose during this period, like the establishment of the YMCA, uh, Sunday schools, uh, the end of slavery in Massachusetts. You remember the uh, the Amistad rebellion, uh, the the uh, the ship of slaves. That all happened kind of during this period. Um, the um, and and many of the converts became aware, be, be, began to believe that the uh, this second awakening heralded a new age and that they need to be ready for the second coming of Christ, which many of them believed was, was going to be imminent. Some of the changes that happened in Massachusetts during this period, in 1811, uh, it was no longer required that town ministers like Parkman had been and others they were no longer required to be supported by taxpayers. And shortly after, in 1825, the formal separation of church and state that had been instituted by the Puritans in the 1600s, uh, that, that finally was ended. So what happened? So as a result, two a couple of major things happened here. Um, within the town and, and within the, the single, previously single town church, uh, Unitarians, Trinitarians, and Baptists began to divide. And also, uh, there were formation within the area of Methodist, uh, Catholic, and Second Adventist congregations. So this was really a, uh, a watershed uh, for the, uh, the, the history of the previous single town church and really set the stage, if you will, given the title of our talk here tonight, for this evolution of religions. One of the interesting things that did occur, though, in, in Westboro is uh, when Parkman died, uh, the, the pulpit was empty and the town began to search for another uh, town minister at that time. Um, but uh, the vote on who would actually be called as the town minister was opened to everyone in town, whether they were members of the church or not. And this was considered to be a very early uh, uh, example of direct democracy, the leading to uh, all town meetings and things like that. So it was a notable event, that the departure, if you will, from the practices in the Puritan church. So in 1816, soon after the uh, requirement to pay taxes to uh, support the town minister was dispensed with, the Baptists left the town church, a group of Baptists left the town church, and they built their first church at the corner of Lyman Street and East Main Street, um, effectively across the street from where the Willows is today, and I think there's a medical practice building right on that corner. Um, and in uh, about 20 years later, as their congregation grew, they sold that building to a group of Baptists in the Woodville area of Hopkinton. And it was, in fact, a personal thing. This is the event that kind of got me saying, "Let's." I'm, this is a very interesting history of churches and congregations and buildings here in Westboro. Because the uh, those of you who are familiar with Hopkinton, Hop Woodville is that section of Route 135 uh, on beyond the dump and before you go to uh, Hopkinton, where the speed limit goes down to 25. And if you haven't noticed that, you probably should. Um, the, the building here from Westboro was disassembled. And in the winter, when the Cedar Swamp was frozen over, it was put on sledges dragged by oxen and taken from 
where the First Baptist Church had been located on Lyman Street, across Cedar Swamp over to Woodville. And those locations are shown on the map here. So that, and that church was reconstructed. When uh, we first moved to Westboro, in fact, even into the 1990s, that original church was still there beside Route 135. Um, but eventually the congregation, their congregation was not able to support it. So due to deterioration, uh, they tore that building down, the one over in Woodville. It was replaced by a smaller chapel um, and the building and its organization is now a, a conference center, effectively. Um, the, um, to replace that church that had been sold and moved to Woodville, the Baptists built a second meeting house uh, right next on Main Street, right next to uh, what is now the town hall. Um, and that building was eventually sold to the Catholics as they established uh, the St. Luke's Parish. That building was moved and was replaced with the present structure on that site in uh, 1869. So um, there's a lot, of, a lot of movement of churches <laughs> that occurred. Fascinating technology. This is a depiction uh, from one of the historical books that uh, illustrates um, what Main, West Main Street was like in uh, 1828. Now you can see on the right hand side is the second meeting house and again I'll talk a little bit more about about its structure. Uh, next to it just to it, the, the left is uh, the Breck Parkman store. Breck Parkman was one of Ebenezer Parkman's sons, was a very successful uh, businessman and had a store, a major store here in the, in the Westboro area for many years. Just next to that is shown the schoolhouse that was set up in Westboro. Um, that is the site of uh, Westboro TV's building today on Main Street. And a picture, a depiction of that original schoolhouse was uh, included in a mural in the Forbes building. Um, and it may still be there, I haven't been in there to, to take a look, but it was on the mural that was there. And the old burying ground, which is shown here, is the, the first town cemetery. And Nahor Rice, who was uh, a child killed in that Indian raid in 1704, was buried there. So the, and this gives you some idea, including horse sheds over on the far right, of what uh, the center of town looked like in uh, 1828. Soon thereafter, a major event occurred, which was the railroad came to town, the railroad from Boston to Springfield and, and further. And the original uh, track layout of that was straight up Brigham Street, right next to the second meeting house, right uh, adjacent to the rotary. And as you can imagine, uh, this degraded the uh, worship experience for the people who were, were trying to hold services in the second meeting house and um, and effectively ev eventually ended its use for religious services. So this uh, it, it, it was quite disruptive when that was that was where the railroad went through town. So right about this town as a consequence uh, the town church further split. Um, the Baptists had already left but uh, the people in the uh, in the town church who remained further split along the lines of Trinitarians who uh, defined God as being uh, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one effectively. Um, they formed what was known as the Evangelical Society. The other uh, portion of the congregation were the Unitarians who held a belief of, of a single God not in any way divided in any of its aspects. And they formed what was called the First Congregational Unitarian Society. Uh, what the societies, the reason the societies uh, came to be was that a church per se um, was unable to enter uh, contracts. It was not a legal entity. So the societies were formed in order to be able to enter contracts uh, and take money in. They in turn owned or built the church buildings and the funding for the society and the churches were done largely by renting or selling 
pew spaces within the church. So each of these societies eventually built their own church. The first of these was what I'll call as a home for Trinitarians. This was known as the third meeting house. And it's on the, it was a, so the site of the, the current congregational church. It was originally a single story building larger than that second meeting house. Um, after the Civil War, that structure was raised, physically raised up one whole story and new rooms, meeting rooms constructed underneath. Uh, there were additions of new pews, a new steeple, some stairs on the front, and colored glass replaced the, the plain glass windows that had been in the original building. Uh, about a hundred years later, in 1965, the church added uh, an education wing and the Parkman Chapel, which I, uh, which I mentioned before. Um, the society uh, dissolved in 1888 and led to the creation of what is now called, known as the formerly the Congregational Church of Westboro. And that church decided uh, to join the United Church of Christ in 1961. So this, this business about raising the building, uh, as far as I can tell, there were at least five buildings that were raised in this way, raised and or moved. Uh, the second and third meeting houses, Parson, uh, Parkman's second parsonage was moved up the hill. The first town hall that was built um, after the, uh, the, uh, the second meeting house is no, more, no longer used was raised. And the Second Baptist Church, of course, got moved from its site at Lyman Street up to the site of the, the current uh, Catholic Church. But I'm surprised that there are no photos that I could ever find of how those things were done. It must have been so commonplace. Um, the Unitarians uh, were able to, they tried to use the Second Meeting House for a number, for a number of years, but uh, shortly said, you know, this really is, is, is not working. The train disturbance the state of disrepair uh, forced them to sell the building, which we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, in 1850, they were able to erect and then dedicate their current church building um, on Main Street. In 1881, there was a chapel and a parlor added, and they needed to rebuild the steeple in 1930. But there was donations and uh, uh, money put forth to do that. And in the early 60s, the Unitarian Society joined the National Unitarian Universalist Movement um, and uh, continue to, to this day as, uh, as members of that organization. So one might ask, I'm sure all of you are asking, what happened to the second meeting house? Well, going back a little bit, uh, it turned out not to be big enough. Uh, as the town grew and the congregation grew. So they, they, they really literally split the building and added 14 feet in the middle to make room for more pews and more people. Uh, the pictures that I've shown here show a belfry. Um, and that was added in 1801. Uh, Breck Parkman, the merchant, bought a small Paul Revere bell and donated it to the, to the town church. And they needed a belfry, so they built a belfry to put that in. Uh, Paul Revere bells at that time were kind of like, you know, well, not quite garden variety, but didn't didn't have the historical significance that they uh, later on grew to to take. Uh, the uh, belfry was also used to house a, a tower clock that was created by a local wa uh, watchmaker named Gardner Parker. Parker was an apprentice of the Willards and eventually developed a whole uh, series of valuable historical clocks in his own right. Um, Parker made three tower clocks altogether. Uh, these were like four feet by eight feet. They were had iron gears. They were massive uh, uh, machinery. One of the clocks went to uh, a Shrewsbury church, and that's ended up in Sturbridge Village. Um, a second one went to a church in Arlington, and it was destroyed uh, when the church burned down in 1856. The Westboro clock, um, once the once the meeting second meeting house was uh, was sold, the belfry was taken down, and that second that 
Westboro clock went to the first town hall in 1839, which had to be built in order to replace the meeting house. Um, until that was replaced by the current town hall. Um, as a result, that clock was lost, literally lost, until 1999, when I understand it was found in the garage behind the Spur House over on Parkman Street. Um, at that point, it was donated to the Smithsonian, and that's where the third Parker clock is today. Uh, the Revere Bell was loaned to the Baptists first, and then was bought by the Baptists later, and was used in both of their second and third ho uh, meeting houses and buildings. And in uh, 2017, that Revere Bell was sold to the Old South Meeting House in Boston, and installed in their belfry in 2017. So the building itself was sold for commercial use. Uh, as I said, it was raised one story, and an arcade, a shopping arcade, was added below um, and served as a commercial building until 1890, when it was replaced by the arcade building on the rotary that we know today. So this is uh, what the rotary looked like in uh, 1875, We're looking up Milk Street. And this is, of course, the arcade building that, that we know today on that same site. So in 1864, um, the Methodist congregation was able to, to organize. Um, in uh, about 1825, the records show that the first sort of self-declared Methodists uh, were known in Westboro. Um, and it's thought that possibly they said, uh, you know, this is the point where if one was uh, part of another church, you no longer had to contribute to the town church. So one suspects that uh, that these folks said, oh, well, yeah, we're, uh, we're Methodists uh, to avoid paying a tax. Um, however, smaller Methodist groups, uh, which were supported by Holliston and Hopkinton churches for several years, uh, began to meet in Westboro after that time. Then the Methodists built their first church on Milk Street in 1864. Um, now, they proposed initially to build across the street, across Church Street, from what was then that became the third meeting house, the Congregational Church. Uh, but I think as some evidence of the sway and uh, that the, the, those from the former town church continued to have in town even at that point, they were uh, discouraged from building on that site across Church, church. Street from the Congregational Church. Um, and the, the rationale was that the Methodist leader was a shouting preacher. So the Congregationalists said, you know, he would be disturbing during their services, they'd be disturbing our services. So the Methodists were persuaded to choose uh, a site for their, their first church um, by, the, by the railroad on Milk Street um, at the site of a former ice house. Um, they, and that, that's shown in the upper, the upper picture here. And you may recognize that that building still stands. Um, but they became uh, disappointed with the location by the railroad uh, and somewhat the structure because of the fact that it was built on the, the foundation of an old ice house with sawdust in the, in the dirt. Um, and they bought uh, in 1897 uh, a vacant uh, church on Church Street um, that had been built by the Second Adventists. Uh, Second Adventists, by the way, were a movement that, that gained traction in the 1840s um, by folks who were felt that the, uh, the Second Advent of, of Christ was uh, eminent. They thought it was going to be happening in October of 1843. Uh, turned out that was, they restudied and said, well, actually it's March of 1844. Um, but as sort of that, although that didn't come to pass, as far as we know, um, the roots of that church gave rise to the Second Adventist uh, uh, church that has uh, survived uh, the Second Advent faith uh, of today. Um, when the uh, Methodists moved into that church, they sold the Milk Street building to the Grange. Uh, they raised and turned that Church Street building by 90 degrees to get the to get because they liked the, the way it would face better. 
and used that church until 1968. Um, they then sold that building to the Masons, who continue to use it. Um, and the first United Methodist Church of Westboro was consecrated in their building, their present building, in 1969. And uh, to uh, let folks know, they've just completed an expansion for accessibility and more space uh, this year and are planning uh, a celebration in the near future for that. So congratulations to the Methodists. Slightly after that, uh, St. Luke's Parish was established here in town. Interestingly enough, the first, uh, one of the early Catholics in Westboro was Timothy Rice. Timothy was one of the Rice boys who'd been captured by the Indians, taken to Canada, integrated into the Indian uh, society, uh, rose basically to be a chieftain and returned for a while. He was converted to Catholicism in Canada uh, there returned in 1740 for a brief visit. Um, in the 1850s in the area, there was a growing population of Irish, French, Canadian, and Italian Catholics. Um, but they were denied the use of town hall for their masses and services. So uh, priests from neighboring towns would come in to serve mass in, in homes. Nonetheless, the St. Luke's Parish was established formally in 1869 and as I noted before, they bought the second church building from the, their, from the Baptists, moved it from West Main Street to the Milk Street, uh, to an area spot on Milk Street near Phillip Street, which is actually now the site of the, the new uh, fire station municipal building, if you have some idea of where that is. Uh, it was right next to a, uh, a major factory. Uh, the bad news is that when the factory burned in 1886, it took the church with it. Um, so the, uh, the Catholics owned land on the site of the present St. Luke's uh, and built uh, a large wooden church, which is shown in the middle picture here, um, finishing it in 1888. Unfortunately, that also burned in 1921, and the present brick building uh, replaced it. So that's uh, sort of the history of, of St. Luke's and, the, and the, 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 the parish here in town. Somewhat later, um, not long, not much later, in, in uh, 1872, um, a group of Episcopalians uh, began meeting regularly here in, in Westboro. Uh, Episcop the Episcopalians are, uh, the Episcopal Church is a member church of the worldwide Anglican communion. It's effectively the Church of England in America. Um, and the, the uh, the church's uh, face it sees is known as via media, which is a middle way that is effectively both Protestant and Catholic um, is, is their goal. Local worship started in 1872 uh, as an outgrowth of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Southboro. Um, the St. Stephen's congregation bought property at 71 West Main, West Main Street in 1899, and the stable on the property was converted to a sanctuary, apparently very, very, uh, very nicely. Um, the present um, St. Stephen's Church was uh, dedicated in 1957, but their chapel in that church still has the original altar and some of the appointments there on, uh, on John Street. A good time later, <laughs> uh, a Lutheran congregation began to form in, uh, in Westboro. And um, like uh, in 1960, the, uh, the Good Shepherd Church congregation was originally part of the Missouri Synod, which was a, uh, it exists today, was a, a fairly conservative uh, synod, to be, to be honest. They met initially in the Forbes Community Building and then later uh, met in St. Stephen's Church as they grew. They built their present church on West Main Street in 1967 and there have been numerous additions since. The congregation decided to leave the Missouri Synod in 1976 and in fact join uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, which is the predominant Lutheran 
uh, organization in in this country, and the uh, became part of the uh, the so-called ELCA. And over the last 20 years, uh, the ELCA has uh, joined in what's called full communion with some of the other um, mainline churches, the United Church of Christ, the United Methodist Church, and the Episcopal Church. Um, full communion uh, is, a, is a, an agreement among those churches that stresses that these churches act ecumenically for the sake of the world. Uh, it's a mutual recognition of their baptisms, of communion, the exchangeability of memberships and clergy, and overall, uh, a common commitment among those uh, congregations and, and uh, churches to evangelism, witness, and service. So those are, uh, I think, important uh, steps taken by, by these churches. In 1987 was the formation of Congregation B'nai Shalom. Uh, B'nai Shalom is a reformed Jewish congregation which actually draws its roots back in, it started in 1973 as a Jewish women, or goes back into 71 as a Jewish women's club, uh, but is yet another example of the mutual support for faith communities in Westboro from one community for others as we've seen in some numerous other uh, formation of churches here in town. Um, they set up a one-room schoolhouse. They started with six children that was set up at the uh, Congregational Church in 1977, and that soon led to the formal establishment of Congregation B'nai Shalom. Uh, they bought the Denfield Estate uh, as, the, as the congregation grew, and eventually con constructed the current building on East Main Street um, in 1987. Today, uh, their congregation includes over 400 families from 20 towns. Quite a growth. In 1990, uh, an independent non-denominational church grew uh, in, in Westboro. It was, uh, as the term is, planted, this New Hope Chapel, planted by the first congregational church in Hopkinton as an outreach ministry. Um, and this is similar to an action that the Congregational Church took to plant or support uh, a new church startup in Waltham. Uh, new Hope Chapel uh, held its first worship service in 86 and in 1990 started meeting in the what, it, what became known as the 1860 Hall, which was the former Grange Hall, originally the first Methodist church building. Uh, they purchased the building in 1993 and the continued services. Uh, in 2001, um, there was the founding of the Beth Tikva Synagogue, which was originally founded as a conservative Jewish congregation. Uh, they moved to uh, a new building in 2001 and 45 Oak Street. But in 2011, the congregation voted to become independent. Um, um, and in uh, 2019, we're able to add uh, a Beck Tithba Community Center on 30 Oak Street. As an independent congregation, this particular congregation values warmth, inclusiveness, egalitarianism, diversity, full participation, and they support and provide the Beth Tithba Religious School. Soon thereafter, um, there was a branch of the Chabad uh, organization established in Westboro. Uh, Chabad is, a, as it says here, a 250-year-old branch of Orthodox Judaism. Uh, Chabad is an acronym for the three major facu intellectual faculties of, of the, the group, wisdom, comprehension, and knowledge. And it's guided by the teachings of seven uh, successive leaders over that 250-year period known as the Ribbies. Uh, Chabad is worldwide. There are 4,000 full-time emissary families and over 3,300 institutions like Chabad of Westboro, which locally meets at 54 South Street. And they're currently working on an expansion uh, campaign. You can see the evidence of that in their, in their picture. 
more recently, 2007, uh, was the establishment of the Church of the Chapel of the Cross um, um, on uh, where, where, they, where the street is, Flanders Road. Yes, it's right there. Um, started in 1961 with a group of families meeting for Bible study, but grew into sufficient following that they were able to uh, buy land and build this church, uh, Chapel of the Cross on Flanders Road in 2007. They seek to be uh, a people in growing their relationship to learn from Jesus, to love others in the community, and live out the gospel. Uh, the church had originally Baptist roots and is now part of Converge Northeast, which is a, a, a lia, an aggregation of, of churches. Um, and the congregation continues to be deeply Bible-centric. And the 13th and most recent uh, house of worship added to town is the Sikh temple, the Gurudwara Sahib, also on Flanders Road, next to the Chapel of the Cross. Um, I learned that uh, Sikhism uh, originated in India, India more than 500 years ago. It is a monotheistic uh, religion that sees one omnipresent and but formless God, uh, blending Hindu principles of Hinduism and Islam. Um, as noted here, it's the fifth most populous religion worldwide, uh, over 23 million members, half a million in the U.S. The Guru Drawer was uh, an outgrowth of the New England Sikh Study Circle, which had its roots in Milford, um, and, and now the core membership numbers over 200 families, so a beautiful building that they've added um, on uh, Flanders Road. So first one, now many. Um, you know, I struggled on this presentation with a big finish. Um, and some people may chuckle at the idea that a talk on religions had a problem coming up with something about to talk about a, a big finish. Um, but as I thought about it more and more, I would, my belief, my feeling is for, for those of faith, religion is not about big finishes. Rather, religion gives us guidance on living together now, as well as hope for future and the religions, all of them, speak to constant renewal. And for us on a personal basis, personal new beginnings, not big finishes. So I want to thank you for attending. Um, turn it back to Kathy, and let's see what kind of questions might have come up during the presentation. Again, thank you very much. I have to get out of this. <laughs> I have to stop. Oh, thank you, Tom. That, that was really incredible. I couldn't get over how you researched so completely uh, all of these different religious institutions, including the formation of the town, which I think is wonderful for people who are new to Westboro or just really have never really known how we got here. And, uh, you know, I just think it's great that you got you started with the Puritans and came all the way up to the present. I think everybody really enjoyed the presentation. I want to thank you for doing an excellent job. Uh, you know, kudos. I mean, it really, really was wonderful. Um, and for the benefit of the audience, I, oh, let's see, there's one more comment here. I was just, just a, uh, to thank you that someone, you know, uh, that Brenda Lord, uh, you know, really appreciated and enjoyed your, your presentation. Well, it's certainly um, my pleasure. And I thank the society for the opportunity to, to, you know, enhance the talk and, and to reach so many people. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I just want to mention that our next, um, our next uh, presentation, our next program uh, is going to be Monday, October 25th at, it's going to be a, probably at 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. at Patnick Books because we have an author. Uh, we're going to have Worcester native and author Andrew Noon will be discussing his new historical nonfiction book, Bathsheba Spooner, A Revolutionary Murder Conspiracy, which is a pretty juicy tale um, and she lived in Brookfield. Uh, and it's a pretty famous story in the in the in the at least in Massachusetts history in the Revolutionary War. It's a it's, it should be interesting, and you'll have the opportunity to purchase his book after his after his presentation.
So um, I hope everyone's enjoyed everything here. Well, yes, you're getting, you're getting your comments are, are just, uh, you know, you're getting more accolades here. <laughs> so thank you again, Tom, for your excellently researched program and talk. And I think we all learned a lot and we can appreciate the diversity of Westboro uh, over, over, you know, this year will mark the town's 304th birthday, which is gonna be part of our November program. So I'll just use that as a tease. But, um, you know, uh, it's amazing to see all the changes and the diversity and how much the community has grown. I want to thank you all for coming and um, we hope to see you next month. And uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you everyone and have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Good night, Kathy.